Welcome to Unrestricted, the show where we hear from incredible women who live life on their own terms, who take care of their mind, body, and soul while building successful businesses and projects they love. I'm your host, Athena Simpson. I'm a serial entrepreneur and life and business optimization coach and educator who helps women uncover their superpowers so they can thrive at life and work without compromise. I went from being deeply depressed, self-loathing and unhealthy to living an exciting and fulfilling life, running a business that I love. I feel stronger, healthier and happier than I ever have before. It took a lot of work and exploration to get to this point and I'm still learning every day. Every week I'll be introducing you to a woman who went on an incredible journey to discover what would make her happy and the subsequent business or project that lights up her soul. I want you to have an unfiltered view into the reality of transformation with clear, tangible takeaways that you can apply to your life and career or business to help you get more unrestricted. So put your phone into do not disturb, minimize any distractions, and let's dive into today's episode. On today's episode, you'll meet Natalie Levy, a business coach for women who want to launch service-centered online businesses in the wellness space. She always knew that she didn't want to work for anyone else, but after realizing that she wanted to change her path from clinical psychology, she got a job in sales. For years, she worked on her coaching business on the side while burning herself out. In this episode, we'll talk about the trap of misplaced loyalty with your employer, how leaving on good terms can get you opportunities, and the importance of an FU fund. Strap in. You're in for a fun ride. Hello, hello, hello. I am so excited for today's guest. Welcome to the show, Natalie Levy. Hello, my darling. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I am so excited you're here. I can't wait to share your story and your journey. I think it's going to resonate and hit home with a lot of people. But first, tell us who you are, what you do, and where are you? Well, I'm also in Tulum, but I'm from New York originally. I tend to bounce between New York, LA, and Miami, where my family is now. So if I'm not in Tulum, you'll find me in one of those three places usually. I am a coach for women who want to launch online service-centered businesses in the wellness space. And I also host an event series called Babes Who Brunch Club. That's for women in the pursuit of a healthy lifestyle and big dreams, which typically take place in LA and New York, but hope to expand. We're, we're going to have a discussion today and go through your journey. And I think it's so interesting and exciting. So I want to start at the very beginning when you were working for someone else, what you were doing and how you were feeling, because you're an entrepreneur now, but take us back to that point when, when you were working for other people and what was happening at that time. Yeah. I mean, the reality is if we really bring it back, I knew that I didn't want to work for anybody since I was like a child. I had the privilege of seeing my father be an entrepreneur and really work for himself and build his own business. And then even my mother, though she was working for somebody else, she always had her side hustle of creating ceramics and art and and selling at fairs. So I was really exposed at a very young age to this idea that you don't have to work for anybody else. And I am pretty insubordinate, so I do not like working for anybody else. And uh, Basically, I came upon the realization at around 15 that I really wanted to work with people and I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. And so I put myself on a path to become a doctor in psychology and uh, with the intention always of having my own office, my own clients, always being self-employed. Long story short, very short, I figured out very early on in my master's program that I actually did not want to get my doctorate any longer. And I really wanted to invest my time in coaching because I still wanted to work with people and I still wanted to make an impact on people in in just a different capacity than therapy. And so after graduating from my master's, I got a sales job and I became a corporate recruiter because basically I really wanted to enter the startup world, but because I had only nonprofit experience, psych related experience, they were, even if I got an interview, they were like, what are you actually doing here? You're either like (laughs) really underqualified for this job or there are better candidates or you're overqualified for this job. It doesn't make any sense. So nobody would hire me, but In sales, it really has to do with perseverance, grit, and personality. You don't have to have a specific kind of background. So I sold myself into this job after six interviews and them telling me on multiple occasions, I don't think we're going to hire you. And I was like, I think you will, basically. (laughs) I think that that's what is going to happen. And I got the job. And at first, it was exciting. I did go into a sales role pretty strategically because I figured if I could learn how to sell beyond just being charismatic or having the personality, but really understanding what the psychology of sales is and like how to go about it. 
that I could really apply that to every anything in, in life. It wasn't actually ever exciting. It was a very toxic environment for a very long time. It was like a mm-hmm. boys club. It was very normal to work 12 hour days and to work your ass off and not go home before your boss. And it became very taxing very quickly, but I stuck it out for a while before I left. One of my other guests was also a recruiter. <laughs> I, I dated a recruiter and it's, it's super stressful work environment, right? I imagine that was having some impact on your well-being or state of mind, especially being one of the only women. What ended up happening that you decided that you wanted to leave? Was there a moment or did you, for a long time, tell me about how you decided to end up leaving? The thing is, I never intended to stay, right? It was always supposed to be a stepping stone. And my managers hired me, even though they really knew, I think all Mm -hmm. along that that was going to be the case. And even when I started coaching, I never hid my business. It was just one of those environments where my manager used to make fun of my business all the time. I had a tagline for a little bit where I was like, be the CEO of your own life, where I was working with just ambitious women with not like really honing in on entrepreneurship or building a business, but just building confidence and self-esteem and really taking ownership over your own life. And my manager would always joke and be like, who's the CEO of your life? He's like, I am, but I can hold my own. So I stuck it out for a long time. I did relatively well in the company. And I mean, there was a lot of good. They did a lot of good for me, but there was a lot of like silliness (laughs) that went on a lot of exhaustion. And so I was burnt out many times before I decided to really leave. But it was one of those things when you're in a sales job, when you're in a recruitment role, you're seduced often by the next bonus, right? And they hold your bonus over you. So like you're already halfway through the next quarter by the time you actually receive your bonus. So if you leave beforehand, it creates issues and then you're already halfway through. So why would you leave before you get your next bonus? And so it was Mm -hmm. like that, those golden shackles almost of like, well, I'm just going to wait it out. One more bonus, one more bonus until I was just not going to hit my bonus. Basically, the, the catalyst, the final straw was I made over $300,000 to the company in 2017, but my last quarter, I think after that hundred K quarter, I basically asked for a raise and I was pretty burnt out. I had big deals in the balance. And then going into that next quarter, they denied my raise. And I, I wasn't even asking for an exponential raise. I was asking to be on par with newbies who were, had just been recently hired and were making more than me when I was obviously producing more. And I didn't make any sense. So I asked for a raise mm-hmm. and they were basically like, well, we're not going to give you a raise just because you asked for one. <laughs> and I was like, did you see what I built last year? Anyway, that same quarter, all my deals fell to the shit. None of them went through. Like I had a $60,000 deal that didn't go through. Everything fell apart. And I was so burnt out and I knew that I had to leave, but I was too afraid because financially I wasn't in a position to really just up and quit. And uh, they basically approached me and, and told me that I was probably going to get fired. <laughs> they didn't end up firing me, but they did tell me, figure out what you want to do because you're not happy here. And we, and basically we know that you don't want to stay. So figure out your next steps and let us know. I went on vacation, went to Mexico city. Um, that was in 2018. And I came back, I put my two weeks notice and I ended up going to Bali three and a half weeks later. There's a couple of things that you mentioned while we were going through that I wanted to touch on. And the first thing is often when we're burnout and working with other people, Sometimes we think, oh, more money will make this better, right? But I'm curious if you'd gotten a raise, would that have changed your feelings about wanting to stay there? No, because I always intended to leave. But at that point, I shut off. I think I just essentially stopped working. They did give me a nice bonus, I will say that. But it's not like I didn't work my ass off for that bonus. They weren't being magnanimous, really, although they would like me to believe that. They gave me what was due to me because I literally worked my ass off for them. But it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, if that's how little you really do value me, it just sped up the process, I think. Because maybe it would have made things a little bit easier in the short term. And I could have maybe put a little bit more money away or a little bit more money towards my student loans or whatever else it might've been. So it would have provided some temporary comfort, but it wouldn't have kept me for that much longer. But it did speed the process because once that happened, I just was not even interested in showing up and smiling. My boss would be giving me lectures and I would just sit there and stare at him like this. No, not like, <laughs> not like just completely emotionless. And that's part of the reason they were about to fire me. Cause he was like, it would be better if you argued with me. Cause then I would know that you care, but like, you're looking at me uh-huh. blank. So I know that you don't care anymore. And what am I supposed to do with that? And I just sat there saying, 
I have been there. I think we all have been there, right? I, I, I remember that feeling so clearly. So when you said your deals were falling through, was this after the raise? Do you think it was in relation to the fact that you didn't feel valued by them or did it happen before? No, it happened in tandem. That's saying that if you don't move, the universe will move for you. And I think it was one of those things where I had to leave. I had to leave. And I kept telling myself, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And I was working myself up to leave at that point. Bali was in the back of my mind. I really wanted mm -hmm. to go. And even to the point where even before they had the conversation with me, I had been in passing telling a friend that I was thinking about getting my yoga teacher certification. And she suggested a school that she learned from. And so I looked it up and I had been gearing up my confidence to go in June. And when I went to their website, it just so happened that they had a yoga teacher training in June. And I realized that and I was like, oh my God, this is a sign. So I applied for a scholarship within a day. They wrote me back being like, you have the scholarship. And I was like, this is a sign. But then I freaked out and I turned it down. I don't know if that was before or after they denied me the raise. I think it might've been after, but it was still like all these things were lining up. And that's why I tell people too, it's such a lesson I've learned so many times when your gut is telling you, your intuition is telling you something, don't really wait on it because you will end up paying more. I've done that so many instances where I skip the early bird or whatever, and I know that I need to do it and I end up paying full price, <laughs> even though I was going to go anyway, because I paid full price for that training because I ended up going yeah. anyway. But yeah, so that's kind of how, how it happened. I was already on the trajectory but still very scared. And I think with everything falling apart and my bosses and I having such friction, I had a choice, but I didn't have a choice kind of thing. I've started working with businesses as well, because I've been working with startups for seven, eight years. And when you start growing, if you don't create a culture where people feel valued, they leave. And, and when you're trying to get your business off the ground or even, even larger businesses, right? Like turnover and people leaving is a huge impact on, on the business. You were a very high performing, high earner for them. And because they weren't helping you or supporting you or giving you space to look after your own health. So you didn't get burnout that you didn't feel valued. Now, not only are they losing you, but they're losing the time that they're going to have to find somebody else that could do the job that you did. And they're going to have to pay more, right? Because they were paying the new people more than you. I would be really interested in quantifying the actual lost revenue all because you weren't supporting somebody to just feel like they had the space and time to look after themselves and start businesses too. So the other thing that you touched on was that you'd started your coaching business. So you were doing this while you were also doing the recruiting. I was trying. I was trying. Yeah. I made a wager with the universe and myself, basically. I was like, when I get a job, there's a coaching program that I had been getting a lot of Facebook ads for <laughs> that really had me like hooked. And but it was really an investment. It was $5,000 easily. And just having graduated grad school where I wasn't working with a lot of student loans because I went to NYU and... It's, it's crazy, but I don't regret it. It was still an investment. I still am really happy with my master's. It was a crazy idea in my mind to invest $5,000 into a coaching program. I had been unemployed for three months. I really think that I survived off the kindness of strangers. <laughs> like I had a roommate who was studying to be a chef. So he would consistently bring home food for me. And Ooh. I had another friend of mine who was very successful and also an entrepreneur working from wherever he wanted to work. And he would pick me up three times a week and like take me to brunch. I just feel like I was super supportive in those three months, but financially I was not in a place to be investing any kind of money. I was like, this job is temporary. I need to invest. And so if I get a job, I'll put it on my credit card. And so that's what I did. I got the job. I put the coaching program on my credit card. And I will say that within a month of working there and a month of being in the program, even though I barely implemented anything, I implemented one thing that brought me my first two clients. But the thing is, at that time, I was working 60 hours a week easily. I was teaching Zumba <laughs> twice a week. I was babysitting billionaire babies on the Upper West Side on the weekends. And then I was also trying to juggle my life and then also working with people and then also building my website and also under learning uh -huh. social media and social media wasn't what it was then it was 2016 it wasn't what it is now so there were so many things going on that it really was happening in the background and so then sometimes there would be months where I'd enroll a bunch of clients and I'd make four thousand dollars a month or whatever and I was like why am I still in my job <laughs> but then because I didn't have the structure to continuously enroll people or even I'd say like the confidence or the know-how uh -huh. at the time I was still learning the learning the ropes I was doing it in the background and there'd be months where I just didn't focus on it at all it's so hard and also admirable to start a business while you're working and working very hard and delivering very hard it's that kind of conundrum 
of do I quit and dive into the business or stay here and get the business to a certain place? So you put in your two weeks notice, but you had an interesting turn of events. What happened next after you gave two weeks? So the truth is that I, there's a lot that I can say about my bosses and my job where there were many instances where they were very good to me too. And so even though the work environment, in my opinion, was pretty toxic, <laughs> I did receive support from my bosses in other ways. And I didn't want to leave. When I left, I wasn't leaving on bad terms. I was leaving because I was never meant to be there. Some people thrive in that environment. They build their whole lives around it. They really excel. In all fairness, not many women in that industry still. Mm -hmm. They have work to do. We're 50-50 in terms of employment, but not in terms of leadership, right? So, mm -hmm. but still, there are people who really thrive there. And I was never going to be one of those people, no matter how good they were to me when it really comes down to it. But still, I didn't want to leave on a bad terms. They gave me an opportunity to kind of ex to explore what I wanted to do. And I was going to do whatever I could to make sure that I was handing things off in a way that was going to help the next person. But because I was out of the team and everyone knew I was leaving, they sat me next to one of our directors and I was making the effort. I was really working. I wasn't just like messing around. And he turned to me and one day and he's like, you know, it, it doesn't go unnoticed that you're really putting in an effort. He's like, to be fair, I don't know that I would be putting in the effort to <laughs> if I knew I was leaving in a couple of weeks to go get my UOT certification. He's like, I don't know that I would be doing this. I don't think a lot of people would. And I was like, well, at the end of the day, I, I want to make sure that I'm doing my part. And so my boss, my, my direct manager, who had a very interesting relationship with over the years, at that point, we were in, in a good place. And he actually suggested to our director, he's like, maybe we can bring her on to fill the maternity role in a, because there's another position or maybe she can come back like part-time later on. And I guess because I left an impression on the director, he said, yeah, we'll tell her to call us when she's back. And so what happened was there was like, there was a department that had been not recently, but kind of, it was still relatively new where they were recruiting for the agency. Cause for so long it was on us, the people who were working there to also recruit, which was just not super effective at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So they opened up a part of the company where there were recruiters for the recruiters. And so one of the women was going on maternity leave and it just so happened to line up that when I got back from Bali two months later, they really needed someone in that position. And so I called up the manager and then I called up the director and they were basically like, yeah. And they worked out the most flexible role for me I could ever imagine. And so that's why I say I do have good things to say about the company that I worked for because they opened that door for me. And honestly, without that support, I would not have been able to start Babes You Brunch Club, which was a huge catalyst for my, my current success. And I started that mm -hmm. in November of 2019. So mm -hmm. It's a tough relationship. It's a love-hate relationship with the company in all fairness, but they did a lot of good for me and I have to give them credit for that. Yeah. I think what seems to happen when you stand up for yourself and you're like, this isn't working for me anymore. Then all of a sudden they see the value in you, right? I had two different jobs that I left, but I was like, peace, I'm out. And they're like, wait, wait, can we work something out? And then I was like, this is great. So I work freelance. I was earning way more money. I was working on my time, but I just, I, I was so indispensable. And like I, one of the jobs I sold in, actually both of them, I sold in projects that I was the only one in the business that could deliver it. So I was like, peace. And they're like, wait, and just negotiated some great things. A lot of women don't realize this is available to them. They just think they have to be like, I'm out and actually it can be a lot of cost savings to the business not to have to contribute to your retirement fund, your this, your that, the other. So being able to go freelance or negotiate a deal where you get to do things on your own terms while you figure out what's next can really give you space and also the financial amazing. security. When I moved to London, I wouldn't have been able to get my work visa in London had I not negotiated that deal, which bumped up my salary, which gave me enough money to be able to take the boxes to get my work visa. And I also had a contentious relationship, but I was never meant to work for other people. I've always walked the beat of my own drum and I got taken into school for my leadership skills. My mom got pulled into the office. So like, it's just, I don't follow orders. When I start seeing things, I'm like, that could be better. That could be optimized. Da, 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 da. And they don't want to hear about it. It's frustrating as hell for both sides, right? Totally. <laughs> they just want someone to do the job. <laughs> and that was the problem with me. I was really vocal and about a lot of things. And not only just our role, but about areas where the company needed to do more in terms of diversity and 
it just, yeah, in a lot of different ways. And even like, I would, I would advocate for ways of like working because having to tell you how many phone minutes I had every single week was just so daunting. It's like, what does it matter if I'm getting results? Why do you need to see that I had like 150 phone minutes? Just silly things like this, where I was like, this is not going to ever, ever, ever work for me. But yeah, it was the most amazing thing to be able to be welcomed back still, despite the history and, and have the flexibility that they gave me. It was really, really special. And I honestly also negotiated a higher salary at that point too. Yeah. And it was really easy. (laughs) Yeah. And for women that are considering leaving their jobs, if you do what I call the emotional quit, which is like, fuck this amount and burn everything behind you, then you might lose out on opportunities to actually give you that, that bridge in between. Because as we're going to talk about in a minute, it, it can take a while to figure out your business or to get it to a place where you are supporting yourself comfortably. And if you're in a place of freaking out about where your money is coming from, then that ends up having an impact on your business. And ultimately just feeling good when you leave a job that you did everything you could, you feel like there is nothing they could say about your work ethic or your delivery, right? Just feeling in, in control in that sense. It's like you working up until the last day. That wasn't about them. That was about you and your work ethic and you feeling good about leaving that place on good terms. And you would have probably done that anywhere. Yeah, I think so too. They did me a solid. I wasn't going to be vindictive in any way. So yeah, no, it felt really good. And it felt good to be recognized for that. It felt good to be invited back in. I felt like I was making such a greater impact for a while. And I had a really great relationship with my supervisor who happened to be the director for a while. And then things just started to shift and change. And there was a lot of chaos (laughs) in my department and my hires. Some of them worked out really beautifully and some others I just felt were treated really unfairly. And there was just Mm -hmm. a lot of, again, the rose colored glasses fell off after a while. And I, I know I was starting to see all the things that created the contention in the first place with, with my company. And yeah. And to your point about the financial bit, I also tell my clients, I'm not one of those coaches who tells people just leap without any safety net. It's going to be fine. For some people it could be for me, I do well in uncertainty, but Mm -hmm. that's not every single person. And so I think the easiest thing for you to do is start building when you already have a support system, when you're like, just consider your job an investment, they're investors, they're investing in your dream. Let that be the case and leave when you have financial either a nest egg, a fuck you fund, as Lacey Phillips calls it, that fund where you can just sit on it for a while and can support you for at least a few months while you get up and running or start building while you have other sources of income. There's no shame and doesn't make you any less qualified. Doesn't make an imposter just because you have another form of revenue supporting you at least until you can get on your own two feet. Absolutely. I, I love the fuck you fund. <laughs> the fuck you fund. It's, it's like, like, go fuck yourself. But yeah, I mean, I, I recommend six months runway if you can, but also that's still not enough time to start validate and, and get a business that will support you in most instances, right? Six months is still quick, quick. So at least testing and trying things out while you're in employment, still you can get an idea. Of, oh, okay. People are willing to pay me for this. Maybe I can take a contract role or continue to do contracting for this stuff, but you're not necessarily in love with to give yourself space to do that. So, okay. So the rose colored glasses started to fall off and what happened next? I was on probation. Basically I had a, at this point I had a brand new manager for a few months and we had a really great relationship and he was so supportive of my event series. And I actually was receiving a lot of support from the company, but at the same time, I just had gotten frustrated with the way that certain of my candidates had been handled. And I was getting really frustrated about the turnover. And I was getting frustrated about the lack of direction in my department, which was not my manager's fault, but there were so many cooks in the kitchen kind of thing Mm -hmm. where everyone had a freaking opinion, but they weren't willing to test anything long enough to see if it was actually working because we were a publicly traded company. So there was so much pressure for performance and for hitting revenue and hitting our numbers and getting all these people hired. So there's a lot of pressure trickling down, which created a bit of chaos in all fairness. And then there was a change in leadership and the person who ended up becoming in charge was not interested in what I had been doing for that past year. He was not happy with the contract role. He wasn't happy with the flexibility that I was receiving. It was one of those things where like you're in or you're out. And Mm -hmm. I got put on probation because if I'm being honest, I once again stopped working. (laughs) I couldn't do it. I was trying. It wasn't even like I wasn't trying. I was just so frustrated that I just stopped. 
And I just couldn't, even if I tried working, it wasn't rendering results. And so he basically told me you're on probation. And I was like, okay, well, I already planned my trip to Burning Man. And he was like, I'm not going to tell you not to take your vacation. It was unpaid also. It's not like I was getting paid vacation. He's like, but once you're back, you're really going to have to decide what you're going to do. Because at this point they took me off contract and I don't know, it was a mess. And I was like, okay, understood. I promise I will work harder to meet my deliverables. And uh, I didn't tell him that I was also going to stay in LA for the week after Burning Man. I told my manager, but I didn't tell the manager. And so he called me and I got back from Burning Man. He's like, so let me get this straight. You're in Los Angeles, even though you're on probation, basically, is, I don't know, not, not verbatim. He's like, and you didn't tell me that you were going to stay in LA. And I was like, well, I told my manager. And I was like, so now I'm just confused about who's like the chain of command. I, I mean... I was insubordinate once again, right? And I knew it. I knew it. I knew I was going to get fired. I called my manager and I told him, I was like, my last day is going to be next week. And it was. That was the truth. Like, <laughs> I walked into the office and he was like, this isn't working. And I said, you're right. And I said, thank you so much for everything and for the opportunities that you've given me since I've, you know, started here. And he was actually the person who hired me, who was also 30 minutes since my interview in the very beginning was like, I don't, I like you, but I don't think I'm going to hire you. <laughs> and as he walked out, he said, okay, I'll tell them to hire you, but I still don't know if you're going to make me any money. Literally, that was the way I was welcomed into the company. And he was also the person to be like, this isn't working anymore. And I was like, you're right. And he let me go. So it was inevitable. I knew it was coming. I didn't do anything to stop it. If anything, my thought process at the point was like, well, if they fire me, I can get unemployment. I think this is a common occurrence of every company, right? And it, it's like, you're thinking about your survival as well. This isn't working out. What's my best strategic plan in this scenario to be able to have a backup, which is unemployment. It was a strategic move. <laughs> I love it. I mean, at the end of the day, they're always thinking about themselves, right? And then they want you to like swear loyalty kind of thing. And it's like, no, because at the end of the day, maybe on some level you care about me, but when it really comes to the company, I'm interchangeable with anybody else. And I know that. And so why am I going to bend over backwards and jump through burning hoops for a company that wouldn't do the same thing for me? I'm just not going to. Thank you. It's misplaced loyalty. And this is something that we all need to wake up to, right? If we're working for companies, especially listed companies that have shareholders, if they don't hit their earnings, if they don't get the same kind of revenue, don't think for a second that they won't cut you, right? And, and we're giving our lives, we're burning ourselves out, we're giving our lunch breaks, we're giving up our yoga classes or whatever the things are, our relationships, our time with friends in the evening for our company, because we think that that is our identity, that is our worth, is doing the best job or always being available to phone calls and texts and that sort of thing. In a second, they would be like, we don't have enough money to pay you anymore. You have two weeks, bye. You are providing a service which you are being paid for, that is a transaction, right? They pay you because you, you are doing your job. They're not paying you because they you like owe you. them something. <laughs> yeah. You don't owe them anything because they're paying you to do the job that you agreed to do. And instead, we just give over hours, if not years, of our life extra unpaid. I'm getting on a rant now. They're no, just, but it's so like, true. Drives I think me more absolutely people, crazy. <laughs> more people need to hear it because there were people who, I mean, myself included at one point, my mental health was suffering. My mental health was suffering because there was this mentality in the office, at least in the early days, where literally verbatim, I was told, fit in or fuck off. You don't complain about how many hours that you work because there's always going to be somebody like working harder. There was a lot of like, this Wall Street kind of mentality that was trickling into our, our company. Another thing that was told to me on multiple occasions, smile and dial, just put on a grin and put your head down. And that was a lot of the mentality. And then they, they would plan all these fun things, but it was all revolved around getting drunk with your coworkers. And so you think these people are your friends and sometimes they are, but you're not working for one person. You're working for the machine. You're working mm -hmm. for a bigger conglomerate. And even if you have a really great relationship with your manager, right, still you could get cut anytime. Yeah, their hands are tied. A lot of us have had great managers that go to bat for us, but it's over their head, some of the decisions, or they totally believe in your ideas, but they can't do anything about it because the leadership sure. team is looking at profits. So the end of the story is just take care of yourself. And yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Do your job. Be good to people who are good to you for sure. 
but don't lose yourself for a paycheck. It's never going to be worth it. You never get that time back. And it's a perfect opportunity when you're planning on leaving to start practicing skills that you will absolutely need outside of employment as an entrepreneur, right? Communication and boundaries, setting boundaries, upholding your boundaries. You are the only one that will do that. And this is a big thing. If I have clients that are still in employment and wanting to be entrepreneurs, it's like, do it now. You're in a job where the role, you could probably do it in your sleep and they value your work and you're comfortable. It's not a new thing. So it's like, you can start testing things out, pushing the boundaries. Can you negotiate for more time? Can you set a boundary? Like, Hey, I'm not working after six and, and sit with that discomfort of actually saying this is going to happen and doing it. When you get into your business, all of your demons are going to come up and you're going to do it way harder. If you don't start learning how to take care of yourself and sitting with that discomfort of putting yourself first. Right. I had Mm -hmm. this with both of my businesses after leaving employment, I thought it was the employment that was the problem, but actually it was where I looked for my value, which was outside of me. So, and not really tethered in what was in alignment with me. So I ended up just working myself to death when I wasn't working at my job while trying to set up the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. So I think that's a really important takeaway for anyone who's listening, who is in a job right now, because often people think like, oh, I'm working. I can't start my business. I have to quit Mm -hmm. before I start. And I think that could be true for some people, but it's not a rule. I think on the contrary, start when you have the funds to do it. And and then when you have somewhat of a safety net, and then it'll be so much easier to continue on once you've left. My first month unemployed, my first month where I really decided to go full-time in my business, I was let go in September, helped my dad move to Florida from New York. And so that was a little bit of a process. And then I... I gave up my lease in my apartment and I started to travel and I went to visit my friend in, in DC and within two weeks I generated like $6,000 in my business. And it was the easiest money I've ever made in my entire life. <laughs> it was just because I had set myself up. I had already been working with people. People knew what I was doing. And then suddenly I was like so in alignment and feeling so good and showing up so much that it was one of those things where I had set myself up to generate that revenue. Once I was really free (laughs) and your energy was freed up to be able to do that work. And it was in alignment. I I found it really interesting. I can't remember who said it, but they said, sometimes we block customers or revenue coming into our business because we think through like, what is that going to mean if I start getting all these clients? And if you're already burnt out, if you're already spread too thin or you're already working, it's like, we almost block that because we're like, fuck, if I get a ton of people coming in, I don't even have the energy or time or space to be able to take this on. Okay. So you left, you already had the coaching business kind of sporadically in the background. Babes Who Brunch, I think was started as well while you were doing this. So what happened next? I'm dying to know. So basically Babes Who Brunch Club was launched in November, 2019. And then one year later, shortly after I left my previous job, I launched in LA and uh, it was just, honestly, I had been meeting so many people that way. I've been collaborating with so many people and getting really cool partnerships with places like Lively and like Lunia and a lot of thousands of dollars of in-kind donations and really creating this ecosystem. Someone who, who came to one of my events, met her best friend at one of these events. And through that connection, had basically went full-time in her business in her early 20s, made $7,000 in her business straight off the bat when she went full-time. And it was all through this one connection that she made at one of the events that I was hosting. Um, and things like that were transpiring, which is always my goal with Babesy Brunch Club. People, when I first started, were like, well, how are you going to monetize this? How are you going to generate revenue from this? Because let me tell you, events are not in- inexpensive to host. I always broke even, if not like lost a little bit of money kind of thing, not lost, but invested more than I made sometimes. But I just knew I was like, it's not really about driving revenue for me right now. I really love doing this. I think it's important to do this. There's so many connections being made. I'm meeting so many amazing people. It just seems worth it to me. I'll figure out the Mm -hmm. rest later. And that's why I tell people just get started. And sometimes it will be an upfront investment and that's okay too at times, but because I was hosting those events, I think I also really stepped into my, my power because I already knew how to build a brand. I knew all the things that I was implementing for Babesy Brunch Club, which is why I was able to bring it to fruition and sell out events of 30 to 50 people on a near monthly basis. There was a reason I could do that. And I was working with people once in a while on mostly confidence and self-esteem building, but in the direction of building their business, but it wasn't what I was focusing on fully. And I think in the process of building Babes Do Brunch Club and seeing the success of it, I realized I knew a lot more than I gave myself credit for. And I also think it just builds my confidence to be able to step into that role. And the reality is that all my clients until that point were 
entrepreneurial in spirit. They all wanted to build something. They all wanted to do good though. They all wanted to give back in some capacity, but they also wanted to build something and do it on their own terms. And so acknowledging that and then seeing the crowd that the events really pulled together again of women who are interested in wellness in some, in some way, shape or form and a healthy lifestyle and also largely entrepreneurial, a light bulb went off and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to step into this role. I, I was very resistant towards being a business coach. Cause I was like, I don't want to be another damn business coach. Mm. I saw in my coaching program a few years prior, basically I saw a lot of my cohort take what my coach had done, repurpose rebranded it and then put it out into the world and, and, and to call themselves business coaches and they made money, but they had never built their business first. And to me, that just felt really out of integrity. And maybe they did help people because they were still teaching strategies that worked, but for me, it just didn't make sense. But after building Babes to Brunch Club, being in this, this community, seeing what I was able to, to pull together and also taking stock of who my clients were up until that point, I was like, okay, that's what I'm here to do at this point in time. I love that. So I just wanted to touch on a few things that you said from that. And I, I went through the same thing, the coach or being a business coach, or even the word coach was really, really hard for me to adapt because I had been advising startups and businesses for seven years at this point, working with hundreds, if not thousands of them at all levels. And having consulted and, and had clients, Microsoft and the UK government office for science and la, 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 la. So it was just like, I saw people going to undergraduate school and getting a degree and then calling themselves a consultant or just deciding that they became a coach and that sort of thing. And it was like, I wrestled with it. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't want to be associated with people that give someone a bad experience. They don't have that experience behind them to back up what they're doing. They haven't lived it and, and they're just regurgitating or teaching. So what I realized though, is like, it, it doesn't matter. People are going to pick who they're going to pick. They're going to like be drawn to you. Right. And if they pick someone bad, it's not a reflection on me. If they pick someone that gives them a bad experience, it's not a reflection on me. They'll still learn something from that. But coach is just a word that people understand. And business is something that even still, I'm, it's more for me, the optimization of, of things rather than the business structure itself. And there's business strategy and that sort of thing. But yeah, the word coach is just something people understand. So <laughs> I wrestled with that, but it, that's where I got to. So I'm interested, you were coaching before Babes Who Brunch. So did what you were coaching people on evolve as a result of that? It sounds like maybe you were reluctant to step in the business space. What was the original coaching and how did you end up getting to where you are now? Yeah. So basically I studied psychology. I did it in undergrad. I took a psych related behavioral counselor type position for two and a half years before I got my master's. My master's was in applied psychology, which was more of a focus on social justice and implementing research and doing research to inform prevention and intervention programs was kind of the idea. And a lot of the people in my program would go on to either become psychologists or go to get their doctorate because it wasn't a therapy. It wasn't a counselor master's. It was really research focused mm -hmm. or they'd go into policy or they'd go into like nonprofit and creating intervention programs or research, things like that. But still, like even in that position, there was such an emphasis on the macro and how that informs the micro and like social psychology and so on and so forth. So I, I had a pretty robust experience in terms of working with people and also like an understanding at the very least, like of the basics of psychology. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I really went into coaching because I love therapy. I think it's maybe not for everybody, but I think most people can benefit from some form of therapy, talk therapy. I just don't think it's the only thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's the tip of the iceberg. And what I was really interested in was positive psychology, which was an emphasis on how to start where you are now and then move forward. And that's what coaching is based upon. Coaching is very much rooted in positive psychology. And that's one of the reasons I decided not to get my doctorate in psychology. Like at first, I think it was just like an old dream and I wanted the validation of being a PhD and going to mm -hmm. get my doctor and being a doctor. And I thought it would add to my credibility, but I still always wanted to focus on, okay, now that we know how you are and why you are the way that you are, what do we do now? What's the next step? Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. always my, my interest. And so I started really confidence in self-esteem building because one of the biggest transitions for me in my life was working through a shit ton of self-loathing and grief because we didn't touch on this, but anyone who's been following me for a while knows this. I lost my mom when I was really young, which was like 
ended up being a spiral of <laughs> emotions and chain of events. And so, which also led me to wanting to work with people. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to support other women in working through their negative self-talk, working through their self-loathing and really coming out of it on the other side and, and acknowledging themselves for the wonderful human that they are beyond body image, beyond all these things. So that's what I was working on initially. But in that process, on more than one occasion, people would approach me and as soon as I was like, able to help them with business. It happened on two separate occasions. One person was from Shanghai. I still don't know how she found me. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea. And after the couple of times where I fumbled, my business coach at the time, because I had another coach at that time, was like, well, maybe it's a sign. Maybe the next time you should be prepared to say yes. And I did say yes, because it's true. Yes, I could help them under identify what their brand is and their voices. I'm better at it now. I'm not even going to lie, but that's why I charge more for it now. I was able to help them build a website and learn how to do negotiate, learn how to sell and, and all these things. And I didn't know how to do that. And so I said, yes. And, and still with that, yes, I worked with that person and I still didn't step fully into that role. It wasn't until I left my job fully when I went full time in September, 2019, I don't think I ever fully stepped into that role until then. And then I was like, okay, this is what I'm really passionate about. I actually know a shit ton about this. I know a lot yeah. and I'm going to go ahead and move forward with this because I feel like this is the way mindset work is built in and building confidence and self-esteem is built in. I mean, you can't build a business without, we, we just talked about this earlier. You, you face all your shadows. You can't really build yeah. your business without confronting all the deepest, darkest parts of yourself. And so it is built into the program, but yeah, I really love helping women bring their ideas to fruition. It's really something, there's something so amazing about that. Cause for so many of us, the barrier to entry is just starting. And once you mm -hmm. start, once you make your first thousand dollars in your business, you can make your next $10,000 in your business and so on and so forth. So that's why I really work with people at the very beginning, because I want people to get started. That's amazing. And on the topic of money, there's so much out there in social media. We're seeing other coaches. We're seeing people seem to have these overnight six figure businesses and <laughs> women end up beating themselves up that they're not getting fast results so that they're not getting there quick enough. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring these conversations to the table is a, it might take a while to figure out what the business is. And then once you figure it out and you verify that people will like pay you money for it, it doesn't mean you get six figures overnight. Right. So I'm curious how that journey was to get to six figures. Yeah. I think again, just to highlight that everyone's journey is unique because I technically started in 2016 and at least started working with people in 2016, but it was touch and go for a really long time. And then I launched an event series, which is one of the reasons I do teach my clients now how to provide value and create events and if, if, like events in many forms, even if it's in the form of like a workshop or just allowing people to be in your energy is okay. really important. So I, that's actually very much weaved into what I teach my clients now, because that event series, even though the, the initial intention wasn't to drive revenue towards my business, it undoubtedly and invaluably impacted my business now. And so I think I went full-time in September, 2019. Well, September, 2019, I say I went full-time because that's when I left my job, but I didn't really start flourishing until October because I was transitioning out of my apartment and, you know, helping my dad move. And October was my first month where I was like all in on my business. And that first year, I definitely didn't bring in a lot. I mean, also the pandemic hit us, right? So I had such huge grand plans for 2020 even as much as to come to Tulum, where I thought I was going to live, I came here in March and then 11 days in, the pandemic shut down the whole world and people were fleeing back to their countries. I know it sounds so dramatic, but at the time it felt super dramatic. People, everyone I was meeting from here, it wasn't very American at that point. It was very European and everybody was like making the decision to stay or to go. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to Florida for four months and at first I was super hyped. I got my Reiki certification, one and two. I launched a podcast. I felt so productive, but then the reality of the situation really started to set in. Not only that, America was in turmoil with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and just the confrontation with what our country really actually represents. So there was a mm -hmm. lot of heaviness, no matter what is really difficult. And I honestly, I didn't market myself at all. I was living in my dad's apartment. 
he has a renter's apartment attached to his home, which was such a blessing because I had my own space, but then also it was close to family. And it was Florida, so it was warm, so I could go for runs every single day. But I felt like there were more important things to do than to market my business at the time. I just didn't feel like in an alignment. And so I generated revenue enough, obviously, to keep me afloat. But that's when I applied for unemployment, finally. Up until that point, I was supporting myself. I was like, I don't need the unemployment. I don't want to, I don't want to take anything else from them kind of thing. But it got to this point where I was like, okay, it's not like I have much access to anything else. I never filed for unemployment, so I'm going to go ahead and, and do that now. I mean, I worked my ass off for that company for four years, mm. and I worked really, really hard. So I feel like stop being proud and do the damn thing. And so mm. between that and having the, the nest of funds that I had generated through my own efforts, my business, that really gave me the opportunity to just say, okay, I'm going back to Tulum without any worries. And I came to Tulum in August and within, I guess my full second year, my full 12 months, I brought in over a hundred thousand dollars in revenue, but it's like not one of those things where like, I've been in my business for two years and I'm already a six figure business coach. It's like, I went on a whole ass journey and took a lot of twists and turns in order to go from zero dollars in revenue to six figures in revenue in two years. That didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's also important to know that people also sometimes get help. Yes. I was going to actually bring that up because the other women that I'm talking to on this podcast, myself included, moved back in with my parents. I, I got stuck in Panama with them during lockdown and Panama did a total flight ban, right? And we weren't allowed to leave the house even. So it was like, well, I could get a repatriation flight to either the UK, which I am also now a citizen of, or the US, both places I had no interest in going and living again, or stay with my parents where we got a two hour window, three days a week to go for essential shopping only. That was it. It was based on our passport number. So you could get pulled over and they were checking if you were out outside of your window, it's a $50,000 fine. We weren't allowed to go and exercise outside. I could go back. But I was like, I, I still haven't figured out what my business is. I thought I was going to write a book and start a speaking tour. I had something booked at South by Southwest. And then that was the first event canceled. So it was just like, shit. But I lived with my parents and my mom was freaking out. And every shopping window, she was going and like looking for the new vegan products just to give herself something to do. So it was just like, I had an abundance of food. I was in a place that wasn't paying for anything. I was like, screw it. And even at one point I was like, okay, well, I can start this business and move to Tulum or, or I take on work and, and they offered support to me and I had to swallow my own ego because I don't want to be a grown ass woman who's on her third business taking money from my parents, but, but it helped me be able to do what I needed to do. So I would love for us all to normalize the fact that sometimes we need help and it doesn't mean that we are not great at what we do. That gives us the space and time to be able to get our businesses off the ground. I also want to normalize talking about privilege, right? Because I, I can acknowledge that the way that I was treated in my company even was due to an intersection of privilege mm -hmm. that I, that I possess. Mm -hmm. The fact that I have a credit card, that seems so common for so many people, but for so many people, it's not. There isn't access to lines of credit to even mm -hmm. get, to get started or start investing. And then a lot of people don't even have families that they can return to, let alone support them. So that's another level of privilege. Like even the fact that I went to school and, and, and went to get my master's puts me in a position of privilege because I have connections with people who can help me in so many different capacities. So also if anyone's listening and they don't have access to all these intersections of privilege, also understanding that it's still possible for you. I still believe that people pull themselves out of the most difficult, <laughs> you know, circumstances and you're not failing because things aren't coming as easily to you because there is a reality where there are odds stacked against a lot of people, which is actually one of the reasons that like, since we're on the topic, I think for people in our line of work, more acknowledgement of that, more talking about the level of privilege that you possess and that supports you in getting to where you are. And then also, since there is an awareness, creating offer suites that provide different levels of access points, because I think people who can't invest necessarily should still have opportunity to learn and get and gain access to information, even Absolutely. if they can't afford a ten thousand dollar investment or putting a five thousand dollar program on their credit card. So that's my little spiel about that. But I just felt like it was important to make mention of based on you know this conversation. Absolutely, and there's a beautiful thing happening in in the coaching 
space. And most of us had very masculine kind of careers and, and we're moving into this feminine way of selling and being. And I really like what I'm seeing in this space where there's so much value being offered for free. There's tons of trainings and podcasts and all these things where you can get your hands on so much amazing information from amazing people who, if you wanted to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, it might be like minimum investment of 10,000, but they're giving out a lot of energy and time and content for free. And I'm doing that as well. Anytime somebody comes to me and they tells me they can't invest, like, here's a bunch of trainings that you could do. I, what's important to me is that they feel empowered and they get this information. And especially when you're in a dark place. I was just talking on another one of the podcasts with a woman who was living out of her car and she had to get a, a council house, which is like state funded housing and that sort of thing. And, and didn't earn money on her business for 18 months, but we can support each other and lift each other up. If women are wanting to become coaches or service-based businesses or, or that sort of thing, people will still buy from you if you're giving up knowledge and giving yourself and giving your energy if they're able to do that but those people that can't buy from you might end up being your biggest fans and and talking about you and just giving you all the love like thank you so much for providing this and it's like that okay. that means just as much to me to somebody being like holy shit this this really helped me so yeah i really do believe obviously strategy is important mindset's really important but also in our line of work specifically being a service-based entrepreneur whether that means you're coaching mentoring, consulting, providing a service of any sorts. If you're leading from a place of service, I just see a lot of times people feel very afraid. They hold things close to the chest because they don't want to give away too much for free. They don't mm -hmm. want people to undervalue their work. But the reality is that if you're coming from a place of like serving, people will feel that. People will be more inclined to work with you, I think. Obviously, you have to present your offers in such a way. That's a whole nother conversation about marketing. But if you're coming from a place of service, then you'll be more fulfilled and then people will also really appreciate the work that you do. So. Perfect segue. I was going to ask you, tell us more about specifically what you do and, and who you work with and who you can help. So in summary, I work with women who are just getting started. Like I mentioned before, that's often the biggest barrier is just to start because the reality is that there is so much information out there and it's very overwhelming. You're like, okay, so I know I have to have an email list. I know that in quotations have to, you don't have to do anything, but do social media. And there's so much conflicting advice and there's so much to do that it's just like, you look at it all and you're like, this is impossible. So my job is really to help you break it down into steps and provide a roadmap and often working with you on a very individual basis to figure out what works specifically for you. And, and then the branding process and niche process and messaging process, all of that, that leads into marketing, that leads into sales, that leads into, you know, basically working with your ideal client. And that's the goal. And I work with women specifically in the wellness space, mostly like so a lot of healers, mystics, teachers of sorts. Even when I work with people who are service-based, it's like, I had a client who's a social media manager and, but she works with small, predominantly women-owned brands and businesses to help them get their voice out there. I worked with a woman who was very multi-talented, multi-passionate, a yoga teacher, a journalist. And we also launched a PR consulting and coaching agency for conscious brands and, and often Amazing. small women owned brands. So even if you're providing a service in that capacity, the underlying similarity is that we all want to do good and give back, but we also want to do it in a way that supports the lifestyle that we dream of and, and, and supports us in a way that feels really good. So that's the goal. And yeah. And then in terms of next type of offerings, I'm also hosting a retreat, which I mentioned to you earlier. Yeah. I was just about to ask you about this because in Tulum, there is a lot of spiritual growth. There's a lot of past life regression and hypnosis and so much eye gazing. <laughs> like you can't go to a clothing swap without there being eye gazing. It's just like okay. several times since I've been here. I'm like, I am burnt out on spiritual growth. Like I want to break. Like <laughs> I just want to feel good for a little bit. And like, honestly, it's a beautiful journey to go on in spiritual growth. Once you start, there's always new layers of it, but sometimes it can be very overwhelming and very heavy. And you're going to be offering something that's a complete opposite of that, which I'm super excited about. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So it's called a make magic retreat. And the idea is to, obviously we'll be incorporating sound baths and things that are very much connecting, but the whole premise of it is to 
use joy as a vehicle for transformation. Because a lot of times, like you said, when you're on a spiritual journey and when you're going through a personal growth period, a lot of times the messages that we receive is that it has to be hard and that it has to be mm-hmm. painful. Mm-hmm. And I think that life is sometimes painful. The human experience, there is suffering. It's unavoidable, I believe. I think the difference is that depending on the way that you approach it, there can be fun even in the hard times. There can be fun in even the painful times because it's the way that you approach the pain. It's the way that you approach the suffering. And then also that's not all it is. Life is not only suffering and and spiritual growth is not only suffering and confronting your ego and your shadow side is not always suffering. Sometimes it can be really fucking funny and comical. And sometimes it can be really fun to be like, Ooh, I, I just noticed this thing and let's do some sort of movement to move through this. And so the, the whole point of the retreat is to really drop into our joy, drop into our fun, feel rejuvenated, and also to drop into the magic that exists around us at all times and the abundance that exists around us at all times and to bring that into our day-to-day lives once we leave. So that's happening in February, February 19th to the 24th. Amazing. That sounds absolutely magical. So if people <laughs> want to find out more about the retreat and the work that you do, how do they find you? Where do they find you? The easiest way to find me is through my Instagram account. So it's at Natalie underscore knows as in K-N-O-W-S. And I will be sharing about all of my offerings there. My one-on-one coaching as well as my group program relaunching next year and the retreat. And that's where the most comprehensive (laughs) information exists. Amazing. I'll drop that in the show notes as well. So it's at Natalie underscore knows as a knowledge. So this has been super amazing. And I appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty. I know having these conversations, we can be worried about where they go, but I think hearing from someone like you and hearing your journey and hearing your process and seeing where you are now, which is beautiful and and doing really important work, the more we can unlock women to realize their potential. It's just an amazing fucking thing. So I really appreciate you sharing. And before we sign off, I'm going to ask you what I ask everyone on this show, which is how would you define living unrestricted? That's such a good question. I think it's easier said than done for sure, but really identifying what does bring you joy and not just for validation or accolades or money, but what brings you joy and you don't even have to turn that into your full-time job or it doesn't Mm -hmm. even have to be what informs your entrepreneurial career. But if you can tap into that place of true joy, that also often coincides with a deep self-trust, right? Because you have to understand who you are and get to know yourself and trust yourself enough to explore your wants, your needs. And as long as you have that, as long as you can build a relationship with yourself where there's such self-trust, you'll get through anything. The hardest of times because you have you so that you can get yourself through it. So I guess that's what it would mean to me to feel or live unrestricted. I love that. I love that. Ah, oh, Natalie, you are a queen. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, my love. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, it's such an interesting conversation that I like, once again, I hope that someone can see themselves in this conversation and realize that they're not behind, that they're right where they need to be. And everyone's journey is so unique to them. So yeah, I think that's absolutely job done. A lot of women are really going to appreciate your candor and yeah, we need more women like you to speak up so women don't feel alone in this, you know, journey of life and entrepreneurship and getting out from under people when we feel like we were born to to do our own thing. So thank you so much for sharing. Hey, man. <laughs> All right, Athena, I hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Unrestricted. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a minute to leave a review or give me a little shout out on Instagram at athena.simpson. If you'd like more content from me on getting unrestricted, sign up for my newsletter where you'll get an email from me every week with the three things that I've been devouring to optimize my life and business. It might include hacks, tips, experiments, resources, books, podcasts, and more, all to help you get more unrestricted. It's totally free and you can unsubscribe at any time. So go ahead and sign up at athenasimpson.com slash newsletter. Join me next week where we'll meet another amazing unrestricted woman to get inspired on how you can optimize your life, business, and career to thrive without compromise. I'll see you next week. Mm